Okay, welcome to um, a new episode of Out of the Blue Comes Francis Zoo. <laughs> 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 And today I have here with me David Hofmeister. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm so glad to be able to um, to have this before you go on for um, a week in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So we can do this today. That's great. I just have to say I'm really nervous. I don't even understand. <laughs> I my heart is pounding so hard <laughs> right now, and I was so. Interesting. I was talking about it in my last show that every time I started to get this this nervous uh, energy or like something was, I actually really like it because I feel there is a message wants to come through or something that really wants to come through and is really strong, mm. and my body can feel it. So, so whatever that is. I mean, yesterday I shared with you a little bit yesterday how I was actually just hoping to fill out whether I have any questions, you know, that I can ask you in a up close and personal way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I didn't come up with any. So just, yeah, came here with complete empty mind. I was thinking, we'll, we'll see what comes through. Yeah. Yeah. I, and the rain, I hear the rain coming, pounding down now and some rolling thunder, so. That's beautiful too. It's like we're being rinsed and washed here. Because it's pretty unusual. Usually we don't have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, our days are so full. I like this, the flow of everything. Even today, there was just so many things. It's just been so full and so rich. And, and yet, uh, just through the phone calls, just the the simple kindnesses coming through and reassurances and and really it's great that we can have a life where we have the spaciousness to just be present and, and experience that presence and feel it and then um, have time for for whatever comes our way. Yeah. So I, I've noticed over the past few days a lot of uh, phone call request for coming in and uh, from different parts mm. of the country and the world was kind of unusual but as I'm getting ready to, to leave and there's so many things going on simultaneously it's just I love the spaciousness and it just comes out and it's just full and rich and but mm. there's no sense of um, really a schedule with it it's just what's next okay what's next what's next just like a cadence yeah Maybe we can go from here, like it's almost like um, you're describing a mystical w s way of living or life that is, you know, on the s surface or, you know, when you look at it, it seems it could be pretty full, one action after the next, but the state of mind is is, um, is a different place, almost like you, you, you cannot um, judge by just looking at the actions and the forms because I you know I came in this studio today just with such empty mind and it's not really new to me because I noticed from the very beginning when I start to speak in a public way um, the more I, I just like my mind just get more and more empty as I approach the time you know about when I w was about to speak and I remember the first time the first gatherings the first gathering I think I, I did with Jason we were gonna talk about specialness in that gathering and that whole day all of a sudden I forgot completely what for, what specialness was and I just couldn't put anything together in my mind I and I, I thought I'm probably should go back to the book, the course, and read about specialness before I, you know, go to the gathering. And Jason said, well, don't undo the undoing. You know, <laughs> allow, <laughs> just allow the mind to be empty. And that just really care, like, that's something that has never really changed for me. Like, 
So every time I, I come to del deliver a message, I, you know, just see that this body is completely being used, and it doesn't have anything of its own that to say or to, you know, to deliver. But it just get into this 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 emptiness and allow things to come through. So do you have do you have anything to say about that the empty state of mind and mysticism? Well, it seems like the empty state of mind is is directly connected with this f involuntary flow. So when we are accustomed to beginnings and endings and we're accustomed to numbers and quantities and measurements and so on and so forth, this involuntary flow just transcends all of that completely. So it would be like if somebody asked us, uh, how many in-breaths do you have during the day and how many out-breaths? It would be like, I don't know. I mean, for most human beings, they, they don't count them. It's just the breath continues. It's in and out and in and out and, and there's no counting. And there's not really an awareness of it. Most people are not of, aware of their mm. in-breath or their out-breath uh, during the course of a day. Mm. And when we think of things like speaking or not speaking, or active movement versus um, sitting still, and these things, we have categories for those. We, we think that those things are like under conscious control. So we have categories for things that are under conscious control and then things that we would say are involuntary. Right. But to open up to the idea that everything is, is involuntary. So there are things that we feel, we can feel is involuntary, like would you say our digestion? We don't really consciously do that. And there are certain things that even belongs to our body, like what we you know, sometimes feel is our self, is involuntary too. But there are things that it seems like we put in a category as con a voluntary. And that's like there is a, a difference there. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that they're all involuntary, they're the same. As we digest food, the hair grows, and as we choose to pick up this cup of water and goes to everything. That's yeah. all completely involuntary. Yeah, it just transfers. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it, that starts to give you more and more of the lucid dreaming quality or the dreamer of the dream quality because everything then is the same. Mm. And, and, and these artificial, we'll say, categories uh, are just washing away. And then as that transfers and transfers and transfers, you know, it's, it's approaching that idea you have no control over the world you made. You don't have control over some aspects and no control over some. It's just no control over anything. So why is that I feel, I f like I feel the difference of the involuntary. I can't, I can't choose the color of my hair that grows out, you know, but I feel, why is that there is a feeling that is so different that between, is that just a pure um, something that we, just the mind is so asleep or so upside down, it just gets so confused, it can't even tell what is voluntary, what is involuntary? Yeah, it's, it's just, um, we just recently watched that movie Lucy where, you know, she was using more and more higher percentages of her her brain mm. and um, yeah there was that point in that movie where she had, been, had blonde hair all along and then suddenly she's walking <laughs> down and it just kind of it just kind of dropped like the the black hair just dropped down <laughs> um, almost like these dolls that you know the hair comes out and it was it reminded me of the movie Simone you know how the right. how the construct the hair just kind of comes out starts off with just a face uh -huh. and a bald head and then the hair uh -huh. and then you can you know ching 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 different hairstyles and uh -huh. ching 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 different dress styles um, so th you could say that as we become fully conscious then we become fully aware and there's a washing away of the unconscious mind or the unwatched mind is what Jesus calls it and there's this careful sense of, of watching or awareness that, that permeates everything. And 
in that sense, there's, there's nothing to consciously try to do or, or to make happen. Mm. And that's very relaxing. That's, that's the point of, of everything, is to just relax into that transfer mm. of training. Mm. So unwatched mind is the unconscious. Mm -hmm. Unwatched, just assumed. There's things that are assumed that assumed. aren't actually true. So sometimes it's a hard word to, to find a category right. for, but un, uh, you could say it's assumed to be true. Right. I have control over my action, my next action. Mm -hmm. That is assumed. Mm -hmm. That's unwatched yeah. assumption. Yeah. And it's with some things, like with, with academia or lots of careers and things, this, uh -huh. you don't really, um, you're not encouraged to, to transfer into that way. You, you know, it's more, there's a lot of conditioning and reinforcement to stay in charge mm. or stay in control. It's kind of built in with all of the disciplines and with, the, with surviving in the world. Mm. But I do think of like, like artistry, um, it was one where there seems to be an opening to kind of get in the zone. And sometimes sports, maybe um, even maybe more individualized sports where there's not so much a looking out to, for teammates or, mm. you know, to collaborate in that way, but, but more individualized sports where you can kind of relax and relax and relax and then feel the merge where you know, you lose awareness of the body and, and there's just this flow. Mm. And it's very, very peaceful and it's very relaxing. Mm. I think of when I first trained many, many years ago for, to run a, like a mini marathon, a 10K race, and we'd go out and just be jogging, running, running, and running mm. quite a few miles or kilometers mm. part of the training. But then there would just be those moments where it would just, everything would merge. And I was, I wasn't aware of anything separate or specific or aware of the b feeling of the body. It just seemed to reach some kind of a, a stillness or an equilibrium or something mm. where it was, everything was just so still. Mm. And it was very euphoric mm. as well. And I think there are some of those avenues where you, people kind of stumble upon those kind of mm. moments and um, think, this is amazing. I would love to remain mm. in this state. Mm. That's what spirituality really is about. So, um, it seems like what we're tapping into is this um, awareness that um, you can say it in one way is, I have no control over the world. I have no control over any of it. And it's all involuntary. But how does that fit into um, what I perceive is, I, I can't remember that lesson, um, that Alisa Moore song that says, uh, the si or the secret of salvation that mentioned, that was mentioned in the course, um, j the gist of it is, this is what I did and it is this that I won't do so which implies that everything I perceive is my will is I did it so I guess when I really think about it go deep to think okay is this just I did all of this or I did none of it I feel they're talking to two separate two two different selves I have no control is the self that believe it is in the world is it separate individual? It's the dream figure instead of the dreamer. And in that way, um, the dream figure actually has no control. Everything is involuntary. But when we talk about the dreamer of the dream, then that the other perspective becomes the reality, which is I did this and it is this I will undo. So um, is that helpful, I guess, to to talk to people about um, you did this and it is you, this that you, you will undo? Well, I think it, it serves to a point and then um, you get to a certain point or a certain stage or phase where, where it starts to go beyond the words. So mm. 
um, you know, that's really where the aim of spirituality is. Mm. And Jesus will say things like, the, our use for words is almost over now, mm. and so forth. But, um, yeah, in, the, in this involuntary flow of the miracle, it, it's never going to increase fear. It's always designed, you know, to wash away fear. Mm. And so it's not so much the words that you speak because you don't really choose the words specifically. <laughs> you're just, you're choosing to tune in to, to an alignment. Mm. You're tuning into your intention, your purpose. Mm -hmm. And then the words even come in an involuntary way. So um, you, there, it takes away all concern about to speak or not to speak or did mm. I speak the right things. There's no second guessing. There's no looking right. back. Right. No analyzing, no trying to figure it out or compare or contrast. Right, right, right. It's very, very relaxing. It is. It is beautiful, and I, I guess I just really feel um, inspired by this thought that we we're really here to forgive, even the words. Like doesn't really matter, you know. There is no correctness or hierarchy of words yeah. because I, I do notice that um, there was a phase where I probably started to think to prefer more of the non-Jew terms and I almost do not want to get into specifics or talk dualistic you know and almost there must be a, like a, a judgment underneath and thinking you know in form there are better and worse so what I just realized now is that you know the state of mind is the one that is really truly delivering a message it's not really about the words and the state of mind can be so steady and you can allow the words to go wherever it wants to go and meet whoever it wants to meet at whatever level and there is no hierarchy and there's no better or worse so because um, that's what I observe from you, like the state of mind is so high and beyond this wor world, but when it comes to there is no restriction or judgment around talking about specific problems, relationship issues, health issues, it's, it's never like, yeah, it's illusion and rise above and yeah. You know, <laughs> and I just feel, I feel very humbled by, by that realization, I have to say, because I see how the mind is addicted to judgment and use, you know, still, you know, use different ways and to judge. And just when I, when I saw that, any kind of preference and selection and choose and not allow whatever in the moment, um, words or whatever to come through, in a complete equal way, um, just to see that that becomes a block, you know, that has nothing to do with the, the state of mind. And even that as a protection or a maintenance of a self-image, you know, that could be a block as well. So I just, I feel inspired by, by this realization. Mm -hmm. And I know yeah. you talked a little bit about this with, um, with the host um, of the Buddha at the gas pump, mm. pump show. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I just watched today, yeah. Yeah. Rick Archer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and just as he was talking about his glimmers of it and glimpses, and, and we would just kind of go into it mm -hmm. deeper and deeper. Mm. But I think you could say that with a number of things that, that we have a lot of signs in this world. Like, um, I've always enjoyed watching comedy shows and typically even comedy shows in Hollywood you know they have their start point their stop stopping point mm. they have the different characters or persons that are part of it and everything when you have an ensemble cast mm. um, they have writers mm. and then when the credits come you know you'll see the names of the comedians or the actors and the writers and mm. producers and directors and so forth but actually the funniest um, comedy that just goes off the chart is is that called ad lib um where where they're they're away from what the writers have written mm. um 
they start to get a feeling, I think, inside that's just so funny and so humorous. And then it, it guides and directs. It, it just kind of goes in an involuntary way. Mm. Um, and uh, whenever I would watch these shows, they were quite famous shows, but when a character or some of the two or three of them would start to get into ad libbing, mm. uh, would just turn outrageously funny um, because it, that was part of it, that mm. it was out of control. <laughs> and they liked it, you know. You like out of I, control. <laughs> yeah, it's like our friend, uh, what was the one? There's a song, I Lost My Job and I Like It. Uh, Lilo. Lilo, yeah. right. She wrote her book. But I lost control of my comedy and I like it. Mm. Um, you know, that's kind of the feel mm. you get. And, um, and I think that's the same thing that we like uh, with different interviews or whatever, where there's just a deep, connection, but everything is, is as ad-libbed, everything is just coming so spontaneously. Yeah. Um, we don't have cue cards here. And we're no. Just, uh, <laughs> prompters and readers, you know, yes. The non-dual <laughs> way is, you know, we, we just don't have any of that and the, there's a lightness and a spontaneity <laughs> and, a, and a, a joy with that. And mm. again, I think it's just allowing that to transfer mm. to everything else. I mean, if yeah. you talk to the comedians, they would say, wow, it was an amazing show. Mm. And they would even watch the, re you know, the taping of it, the replay, and would just probably roll laughing at seeing it. But then, you know, going home to what seems to be a home and a personal life, dealing with the daily issues of being a human and so on and so forth, then it's not that feeling of, of kind of ad living. But the A Course in Miracles does say it is possible to listen to the voice for God all throughout the day without mm. interrupting your regular activities mm. in any way. It's basically saying you can do this mm. and you have to really be willing to do it. And I think you have to trust that, you, that it's going to happen. Because I, right before I came on your show, I was completing a few more calls and um, one of the calls of a friend who's been working with the course and working with our community for some time and everything, mm. you know, had just um, let go of her car and um, was just moments before the call had had gone in to quit her job and was feeling them very strong except there was just some undercurrent under there like it was still maybe in disbelief of the whole thing even though it was feeling very guided, very prompted and very, really, maybe exciting even mm. of, of of how this adventure would go. Right. She had to told me earlier, a number of weeks ago, that she was inspired by peace program actually, huh. and um, was, you know, wanting to trim down. I got a call, or it was actually an email last week, the same thing. Uh, a, a man, a friend of ours, saying, "I feel to lighten my load and sell all my possessions and." and just go for it. Mm. There's like a call into that spontaneity, into that mm. trust, and away from the, the seeming structures that provide safety and security. That's it. I think that's, um, that's what's behind this show as well. When I first f uh, felt the prompt of, of this show, and there were suggestions of, um, of the names for this show, um, and I was talking with JP, and he said, um, what, what, um, what do you feel you want to deliver? Like, what is really the purpose of this? And you want the name to constantly remind you. And I, you know, at that point, I didn't know the name, but I thought I, I would like to extend the inspiration that's in the mind that is fresh and that is out of the box. Mm -hmm. So, which means not not restricted to rule or not something that is correct, only correct. I want it to be like, <laughs> <laughs> only correct. yeah, like, <laughs> I don't know what is correct. Just, just be completely fresh and inspiring. And, you know, as, as you're saying, sometimes in this world, the problem is their, their, their duality. And we're trying to um, avoid one side and pursue the other side and it's never going to happen and it's the same even if I want to use language in a way that it's, it's only correct and it's not 
incorrect, you know, as however I put the mark or the division, it's just never going to work. But really, the speaking becomes a way to, to watch judgment and to wash through all the judgment and blocks to, yeah, just to, um, to the awareness of love, really. Yeah. So that's why out of the blue is, you know, just out of nowhere. And that <laughs> does re remind me every time that, you know, there has no rules and there's no box and we can just allow the, the moment to come up and whatever that's fresh and inspiring to be extended through this, so. Yeah, it's beautiful when you can just see that it's, you're doing it to extend an experience and that that's completely and only why you're doing it. It does, it's not tainted with other motives. Mm. You know, for example, if you took something just as simple as like a, a television show or an internet talk show or anything like that, mm -hmm. you know, as soon as you bring in the commercial component, as soon as it involves ratings, mm. as soon as it involves audience and size of audience mm. and target audience and, um, you know, a woman called me with a marketing call uh, a couple of days ago and she was talking about Google and she was making some suggestions and she said, you know, have you heard of Google Analytics? And I said, oh, I think I might have heard the name. And she said, well, you should check it out and I think it could help you. It's really, that's a good example of demographics and who's clicking on what and where they are and, you know, all kinds of things. As mm. if you can find out more specific knowledge and it can help whatever, right. your target audience or your marketing or whatever. Huh. And so I went on there and just came to the introductory page and they said, uh, yes, for a fee of only $150,000 per year, <laughs> uh, your business can take advantage of uh, Google Analytics. And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, but that was a, a quick, <laughs> but, but actually, uh, it's the purity of the motive, it's the purity of what is it for uh -huh. that's good. I mean, I, I'm heading down to Brazil and you know, they had ambitions of getting a lot of things, books translated, Healing in Mind and different books translated into Portuguese um, in advance of my coming and, and making a lot of free copies for the people to pass out and everything, but, but we really didn't have a real good um, translation of Healing in Mind. So in the end, they picked a very s small little booklet, mm. very deep and precise and concise. Purpose is the only choice. Mm. And they were able to translate that. And mm. now it's, I guess it's been a couple hundred copies have been printed off. And they're just going to give those away. Mm. But there's a simplicity um, when we come to what our motive is. What is it for? Mm. And I think what is it for is a, is a question that, that is designed to simplify everything and also wash away the ego mm. because uh, the ego doesn't really understand purpose and yet it's mm. there. The, the spirit's purpose is there for us. It's this unified purpose for mm. everything. It brings fragmented perception together into mm. this beautiful holistic perspective. So I, I think it's just wonderful to just come forth with just that, the purity mm. of that and not have any other motives. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. There's one thing that just came to my mind as you were talking um, is you are, a, you know, you are considered or recognized or seen maybe by people as a um, teacher, as a spiritual teacher. So I guess I want to explore a little bit about teacher-student relationship and what is really what is really about for you. I guess, um, you know, as the course, I remember when I was um, living in, in Sydney, Australia, and when I first picked up the course, I read that it's a self-study book. And then um, I um, started a group. I, I didn't want to, I, I couldn't really teach at the point. I just facilitated um, the group. And then I, I was hearing about you, and there was a, 
resistance in the mind when I first heard about you. And now when I look back, I can see how just any judgment about anything really is to be forgiven for my own freedom. But at that point, at, at that point, the resistance was um, teacher, like almost like a teacher is necessary. So, but then I came to you and I'd be, you know, I just started to just really um, practice whatever that, um, that was guided um, by you. I was actually really seeing you as a, a way shower, you know. Um, so I guess that would be interesting to maybe just hear your perspective. Of, do you see me as your student? No, it, it, there comes a point where the, there's certain metaphors and steps, almost like rungs of the ladder, mm. and, and they seem for a time to, to have a meaning, and they get used, and they're spoken of, and the Spirit seems to be using them, and then and there comes a point when everything starts to fall away, or everything, you could say merge is a better word, because you're coming into holistic perception, mm. and then the idea of teaching, it, it's pulled off of bodies, so it's no longer, the concept is no longer associated with bodies. Mm. And so it's more, teaching is more associated with thought. And, and then uh, this idea comes in that you're teaching all the time. It, teaching isn't um, something that's done with a body or through a body, which when we talk about teacher, you know, those connotations come up right away. They even have awards for teacher of the year. Mm. And, they're, and they're talking more of academics, mm. you know, grade school and high mm. school and mm. um, university and so forth. But you, you start to see that it's that to teach is, is to think. Right. So it's then it's synonymous with thinking. So then you see that you're teaching all the time and then it's, it's not so much a matter of if you're teaching or if you're not, because you're teaching all the time, or uh, when you start teaching or you stop because you're teaching all the time, the question then becomes, what am I teaching? And that would be based on your, on your state of mind. Um, you're teaching and you're learning a state of mind. And then to be a consistent teacher, you can't really ever become consistent with the ego. You could never be consistently wrong-minded. That's impossible because it contradicts um, how the mind was created. You can become increasingly right-minded and then ultimately consistently right-minded because that's a reflection of reality. So it can go that way and mm. it does go that way. Inevitably, mm. it goes that way. Like Lucy, mm. you know, it was, she knew that it was a very short time, maybe 24 hours that she had but she intuitively knew uh, that she was going into wholeness, and it was reflected at the very end when, mm. when the question was asked, you know, where is she, where is she, where is mm. she? And then finally um, on the, the cell phone, mm. I am everywhere. Mm. You know, that was the answer. Mm. And, and so here at the Metaphysical Center, where we are right now, um, when we came in, fascinating place, and it has a blackboard there in the kitchen, and uh, when I first came in, there was some chalk around, so it was like, draw a heart, teach only love, and it's still there. Nobody's erased it or mm. spit on it or anything. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, it's, I, amazingly, for however many years, three years ago or so, that it's, it's just still there as a reminder. But I would say that we teach by attitude, and if our words are in alignment with our attitude, then that just helps lend um, some support to the words. Mm. Uh, I was just a, did a Buddha, Buddha at the gas pump. Um, Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> Buddha is Buddha. Uh, I did that interview and, and I talked about words are but symbols of symbols twice removed from mm. reality. And we were kind of having fun letting the, them come in a very flowing and voluntary mm. way. It was a very joy, joyful and experience. But, mm. but I was teaching in there and saying that basically it's the attitude that does the teaching. 
and it's not the words. So, so really, everybody is teaching. Yeah. So so everyone's teaching, and they're teaching by their attitude, mm. and whether their words are there or not, in whatever the facial expressions mm. or mm. whatever, it's it's being done at the attitude level, mm. and. It's good to think of it that way because then you move beyond mm. concepts of teachers and students and the teaching begins sometime and it mm. has an end. You know, a teaching session as if it has a beginning and an end. It all just starts to mm. merge together because mm. everything is together mm. in actuality. Mm. Mm. Also, I was asked too about um, this thing of enlightenment and I said, well, people aren't enlightened. so." You know, when the question comes, do you say you're enlightened, you know, again, it's, I said on the interview that David isn't enlightened because people, persons, don't get enlightened. That's, again, it contradicts, um, like, mainstream, I wouldn't even say mainstream, but probably uh, metaphysical circles or non-duality circles mm -hmm. where we're talking about <coughs> enlightened teachers as if there's enlightened teachers and unenlightened teachers. And one thing we know about enlightenment is that it's all inclusive. So, mm -hmm. even within that metaphor, it wouldn't make sense to have enlightened teachers and unenlightened teachers. Mm -hmm. But when you you could talk about an enlightened mind, would just be a mind that knows itself, mm -hmm. or an enlightened soul is a soul mm -hmm. that knows itself. But the interesting thing about it is what you experience as yourself. You also see everything and everyone as as well, because everything is ultimately mm -hmm. the same. Mm -hmm. And the split mind is not a real split, and therefore its mind is all encompassing mm. and, and holistic. So again, that, that can be felt as an attitude where you just feel this love and connection and oneness and every, it, in, it automatically includes everything because there could be nothing apart from that oneness. Mm. But it goes way beyond these concepts of uh, teachers and students, and it's not surprising, too, that, that sometimes even teachers would retire uh, because the, you might say the, the very concept of a teacher has to be retired mm. at some point, just like student right. has to be retired, or even seeker, spiritual seeker. You have to retire that concept at some point in order to experience yourself as mm. you actually are. and. Um, that time comes. That time comes for the laying aside of those things. I, I can feel it. That's beautiful. Yeah. There's nothing to contradict. You know, it's, I, I feel this connected experience, but when people say something or write something, like somebody just wrote in recently, a couple of weeks ago, saying um, that they were very impressed with my students. And, um, and so on and so forth, but I, I really don't see it that way. I, I don't even have a student, um, but but it's all just interpretation. There was a time when people would come and say, "I am your student," and and, it, and if I at that point had said, you know, I I don't have students or whatever, they'd say, "Oh, you reject me," or "Oh, you turn me away," or whatever. But it's not it's not that, that there actually are students. That, that could be rejected, you know, you've, the very idea, you know, doesn't have any, make any sense. Right. And so, so a lot of times people will say things, and it's the same when you travel, when you and I have traveled, if I travel with a, with a woman travel partner or with a companion or whatever, then people will say, oh, your wife, your girlfriend, or so forth. Yeah. Like the first time we went to China, it was, it's that amazing. seemed to be, it was like, they didn't have gossip magazines, but it was like a gossip buzz <laughs> seemed to be all around us, just showing up there. Yeah, yeah. But it's the mind perceives what it believes. So yeah. if it, it believes in that construct, then of course it's going to perceive it. Right, right. Regardless of what anybody says or right. does, it's, it's perceived. Yeah. It can be like, a, I don't know, a comforting symbol or something. I, and these questions of um, relationship, you know, sometimes I feel, recently I, I just feel like I don't really understand this word because it seems to, okay, are you asking whether the two bodies behave in a certain way that fit in a box or you're asking about an experience? Because 
I am is mine. I can I can feel this 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 I am mind and experience, and it feels like this body. Okay, if you ask about the category, okay, then that's the answer. No, but experience-wise, it's very. It it doesn't really fit in a category or it can be boxed in or labeled or defined. It feels a vast connectedness um, when it's given in the moment. And there is some kind of quality that's the same with whoever that shows up, you know, in different forms. But so I feel like it's almost like if I say yes, that means something. If I say no, that means something else. But the experience is completely transcend that label for um, relationship. It's almost like implying that I'm relating to you or I, I'm relating to other people in a specific way. But um, it's almost that like there's no consistent. There, there is some kind of consistent still. It seems like the form, when we talk about there is no control um, around the form. So it just feels like the script is playing out and the body seems to be in certain way with a particular one for a certain period of time. But the experience is completely beyond that. Yeah, it's a world of specifics, and and it's made by the ego. And yeah, the ego asked the first question, "What am I?" And it it made up a bunch of specifics. So it asked the question, and it made up its own answers, and it made up its own boxes and its own concepts and its categories, and they seem to be shuffled around and seem to be ever shifting and changing. So there's a there's an uneasiness with all this shifting and changing. It's very mm. unnatural. The mind is used to being calm and still and mm. actually abstract. So this world of specifics is a world of deception mm. and all of these concepts are all part of mm. the deception. And so even around any word, it, it's going to have, um, initially it's going to have specific connotations. So relationship, you know, it's like like when Freud would do free associations, you know, or uh, psychoanalysis would, would, analysts would come up with, say a word, and then they would free associate. Very much like uh, Rorschach ink, you know, block, where they show you ink blocks and then say, say what you see, say what you see. It's these associations in the mind. And then um, as you go deeper into purpose, you start to unwind your mind from all these specifics. Mm. And the specifics then don't have the same meaning that they had before. Mm. They're more like just props mm. and they get used here or there to serve a purpose, mm. but, but the specifics mm. lose their meaning completely. Mm. Um, and this is why miracles are involuntary, that even when you're, someone's asking a question, mm. um, it's usually because there's a curiosity there, but there's a fear underneath the curiosity mm. because this, this, I don't know who I am and I don't know who you are and I don't know what's happening to me. It's a little bit like Alice going down the looking glass and the shapes and the sizes or proportions are different and, you know, and there's mad hatters there and it's, you know, that's about how, it's a good description of this world. Mm. Um, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, it's, it's kind of a good metaphor for this world. So recently when we went down to Florida to, to share uh, about the, the book on Wind Your Mind, you know, we agreed to do an interview uh, the, before the uh, workshop started. And then when we were there, just as an icebreaker, our interviewer mm. came in and she said, just can I ask a personal question before we get started? And, and again, it's just it's an attempt to, mm. to kind of get a context or or have some kind of connection, connection, right. or even if it's a conceptual understanding. Mm. Um, and so the question then came out before the cameras were rolling. Everything mm. are you, are you together? Mm. And I remember you just kind of looked, at kind of like uh, hmm, curious questions. And then are you two a couple? You know, in other words, that was the meaning of the question. Mm. And then you said, shook your head no, and then it's like, oh, okay. And then that, that was a conceptual mm. thing. It really, 
nothing ever stops at that level of specifics. Mm. But it can be just, ah, that's a context. But really, uh, you know, I've said that for years, you know, like, are you a couple? I, I would come back with another question, a couple of what? <laughs> and they would go. A couple of yeah, they persons. Just weren't ready. <laughs> yeah, they weren't ready for the re return question. They wanted a, a yes or no answer to the first question. And I'd say, I'd answer the question with a question, a couple of what? And they'd be like. The what is a real question. Are you a her person? Wh are you what are you? <laughs> right. is, is like, is, right. is a real question. Right. In fact, Ramana Maharshi would say, you know, that's such an important question right. that he based his entire mm. pathway to self-realization on that one, you know, who am I? Who am I? You know, so it's, it's, a, it's an important question. But if that's an assumption, it's the assumption of personhood. It's the assumption that everyone's a mask. Mm. Is it a single mask or a couple of masks? Or is it a group mask? Is it, are you a group? Are you a community? You know, <laughs> those are the kind of things. There's just a bit of fear mm. underneath all the questions because the mind doesn't really understand what the, what the question really is. Mm. And the questions, as Jesus says in the Course, aren't really real questions. They're, statements. they're ego statements. Right. So just imagine, you know, you've got seven billion people going around and, and what we think are you know, real questions between the seven billion are just the ego restating its basic assumption of separation. Huh. So when you put it in that context, it's, it just gives a whole new twist to it. Mm. And then you see a movie like Her, right. you know, which, you know, is all about opening up past that fear, right. coming to true deeper connection, a lightness, a mm. laughter, a trust, an intimacy, mm. and then that still starts to grow stronger and stronger until, you know, it's like, were you talking to somebody else? Mm. How many? Well, for, she's saying, I'm doing simultaneous conversations, mm. and it starts to multiply way beyond the mm. comfortable confines of, of mm. interpersonal relationship, and it goes way, way, way beyond that. And mm. the same with the movie we just saw, Lucy, another Scarlet. Mm. Johansson movie, mm. um, and then I just had, got off to a, f a phone call, and they apparently, s along with Lucy, she's released two movies at the same time. It, the other oh. one's coming, but under 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 the skin, under the something. skin, or something like that. Okay. So I was told you've got to see that one too. Okay. So it's like okay, another <laughs> Scarlett Johansson film to see, but but underneath it is it's that washing away of the questions in the end. I love it. I, I tell you, I feel I'm actually really touched by what you're saying because I see this is what we say as not, no compromise because it's not about who is right and who is wrong. When people ask a question, <laughs> I'm not here to say there is no person <laughs> and this question does not make sense to me. You know, it's about, it's not, it's about love and connection and just really see was underneath all of that, and Jesus said in the book, you know, never, um, don't forget how frightened your brothers yeah. are, yeah. and just remember the purpose of everything is about love and connection, and it's not about being right, yeah. proving anything, you know, even, even that, like, just someone asks a question, and that's where, you know, comes back to what we just talked about, like the, the love comes down to wherever that it means where the mind is at and has opening. And, you know, in that everything become clear and seen as what they are because nothing really needs to be, you know, collect, cor corrected except this vision, yeah. this awareness, you know, that doesn't see what is really going on. Yeah. So, thanks for that. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful insight, it's a beautiful wisdom mm. that, that you don't have to correct anything or anyone. And then there's this like this mm. gentle watching. Mm. Um, there's a lightness, there could be some smiles mm. and some light gentle laughter with it, but, but there's not a sense of trying to prove anything mm. or be right about anything. Right, because that's, that's really what we're teaching. You know, we're not teach the right to be right in this world or in anything. Yeah. Because there's nothing that's more important that was underneath all of it. That's yeah. love. Yeah. Even the course, like when Jesus said to Hel Helen, this, 
you know, scribing seven years of effort and this amazing book is nothing compared to my love for you. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing that after all of that, that that's really what it was all about. And, mm. and this interview I did for Buddha at the gas pump, mm. it's whenever you come together and it's this kind of a meeting in the mind and there's these deep kind of almost um, ontological, philosophical questions that will come up. Um, but the presence of love that is there that just infuses every word it's and the gentle lightness and the laughter, that's, mm. that's really what the teaching is. Mm. And then if you follow it, you know, you can follow some very deep um, directions, like it's all pointing to unification. Mm. And uh, it's leading away from doubt and fear and skepticism and it's pointing into acceptance. And, and simple kindness mm. and simple respect and uh, yeah, we have to feel grateful that there's this context of even community is just another context it's nothing special or different there's nothing um, special about it at all but it's just a context you know to teach what you would learn you know extend the attitude that you would keep in your own awareness mm. and it's a great opportunity for that and uh, I think I think we both enjoyed it, and I think everyone that's that's come. I just watched uh, the La Casa de Milagros video. Coconut, TV, Coconut that TV that Maria Maria put together. She just visited our vibrant community in Mexico and put together this interview. It's just so so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and I could feel that there was so much sharing of the gratitude and appreciation for that. And it's something that we cultivate. We just carry with us in our hearts. So when you and I have gone to, like, to, to China, um, again, we there are many people there, and uh, it was. I've always had fun saying when we went over there, it was like the Beatles, you know, when they first came to America. There was <laughs> so much attention and swirl of things going on and, and everything, but we were just really having fun with all of it. Mm -hmm. I did say before going, I said, it's John and Yoko yeah. going and uh, and so just enjoying it like like they seem to do pretty good. I mean, it, it would get to them occasionally, uh, but it would always be something personal. Um, but they they were aware of the vastness, I think, of that was behind it all right? and would stay kind of tapped into that as, as best they could. And for us, it's, you know, that's our life. It's, it's not we're not trying to get a glimmer here and there. It's, mm. it's about truly staying and extending mm. that all-inclusiveness, that, that vastness, mm. you know, with everything and everyone, regardless mm. of whether it's, a, it's an interview or going out to dinner. Um, nowadays, I'm sure if we went back to China, you know, even in the time since we were there last time, it's, it would even be more surreal mm. than before, um, and maybe even more comical, like uh, <laughs> that movie that Scarlett Johansson did, Lost in Translation, <laughs> with Bill Murray. And uh, I actually didn't feel a lot of Lost in Translation when we first went there. I feel there was almost a universal language that was so loud that was present that people could hear you. You know, it doesn't really matter. You just like they they look at your eyes and they cry. I just watch that with amazement. People just cry and break apart and couldn't be away from you because they felt something that's not really in in words and in language. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's when we talk about it being involuntary, the miracles involuntary, what that really means in practical terms is you you have to be clueless really about everything. You have to stay clueless. And it's really not hard. You know, because it's easier to be clueless than to, to have, then, think that you have a clue. Right. It's much harder to think that you have a clue because you'll get into expectations and huh. and you'll get into all kinds of fear and worry and anxiety. But, um, you know, you just don't assume that. You know, it's fun to practice that um, with everything. Like, um, it's fun going to the airport and not being absolutely sure the plane will take off. And, and that's a fun experience and then so and the and the rare 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 chance when the plane doesn't take off you're like hmm, 
Okay. It, you know, it's right in the flow of, of everything. You're not assuming anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt that too in crossing into different countries. I never assumed that this body would go into another country. Um, it's just almost like you're just pleasantly surprised about everything mm. because you're so clueless. You're like, oh, well, this is the way it is. Mm. Oh, this is the way it is. Oh, this is the way it is. Mm. You can stay in that kind of childlike sense of wonder with everything. But, and then nothing really can go wrong. You know, you can't really be late or you can't be er early, so there's no anxiety around either of those. Um, you can't really be delayed I at all. You know, it's it's like that movie, Lucy. It was all, all the human definition is all tied in with time. Mm. And if you are clueless about time, mm. then then you might say you're you're fully who you are. But it's certainly not human. Um, it certainly far transcends <laughs> the human being. And that's a wonderful thing. So I I like that. And I I know that that takes trust. I, I just read. Um, an article a day or two ago where this, uh, the woman, uh, was it Sophie Capra, or was it the woman who shot Lost in Translation, the... Oh yeah, uh, Cop Coppola. 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 Sophia Coppola. She was describing that, um, that whole process where um, she had in her mind, she'd, she'd lived over in Japan, so she had a lot of experiences in, in the hotel she had stayed in the hotel mm. there and lived at that hotel, so they allowed her to film mm. in the hotel. And, and she was so happy to get Scarlett Johansson on board to do it and everything, but but she just was not sure about Bill Murray. She, because she said nobody knew whether he actually would show up, <laughs> to come to Japan to film. So they got the whole crew there, she's there, they got the hotel, Scarlett Johansson, they've got everything, the whole movie's planned, but Nobody really knew if if he would actually show up, mm. and yet they went ahead with all their preparations as if they were going to shoot a movie, mm. and um, and then they were happily surprised when he you know he did show up, and and then <laughs> and the movie went on, and but um, it's nice when you you can stay in the cluelessness, and you can really that's really staying in the moment. Mm. And not thinking you know what's coming next, or you know how things are supposed to go, and all of those, you know, constructs and judgments. You know, that's that's where the difficulties always come in, because there's always something like Jesus says. You always um, add a little bit to the script, or you attempt to add. You know, you always add something. The ego is trying to add something in all the time, mm. and. Um, that's where these expectations get generated. Mm. But there's no need to to persist in that way of of living. Mm. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really enjoy this. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. We just show up. Yeah. And it's great that you're doing this show because I know we are scheduled to show up and show up at quite a few places this year and yeah. Yeah, you have such a busy schedule, you know, Brazil and here, Strawberry Festival, Mexico, then Ireland, Scotland, We've Finland. got California in there in, the, in right, September too. Right, I forgot too. that. Yeah, Bay Area. And the whole Europe and then the whole South Africa. Yeah. Yeah, which is nice because it's for me that's a, it's got a surreal quality. Mm. You know, it's more like just observing it, and it's not. I don't feel like I am moving. It's just you know, it's like the the scene. The scenes are shifting, mm. but it's very much like when you're watching a movie or mm. or you're viewing, you know, viewing a photo album or mm. whatever. You know, you feel quite stationary, mm. and then. It's just coming and passing and passing and passing. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Out of the blue comes Francis <laughs> Blue. <laughs> <laughs>